If you're a B2B business, a B2B tech company, or a B2B marketer, you're in the right place. Coming to you from Studio 26, this is the Interesting B2B Marketers Podcast. Bringing you interesting contemporary takes, industry tips, guest interviews, and true stories from B2B marketers in the trenches. Now, here's your host, Steve Goldhaber. Hey everybody, it's Steve. Welcome back to Studio 26 and Interesting B2B Marketers. Today, I'm joined with Stephen Hildebrandt. And quick welcome to the show, Stephen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Steve. I think we kind of have the, a similar name, just our oh, mine is the Danish one and uh, yours, the, <laughs> the American version of it. That's right. We've had a lot of Steves on the show recently. So <laughs> so maybe that's our, our guest acquisition strategy going forward. Just, <laughs> S, just S's. All right. So welcome to the show and just give the audience maybe like a quick 60 second overview of your background. Yeah. I have it too, Steve. So yeah, name is Stefan. I've been in B2B marketing growth related roles ever since I graduated, graduated university now almost 15 years ago. And it's all been B2B companies. It's all been highly digital or completely digital companies. The last seven years or so, eight years, I've been a B2B marketing uh, leader. So and I think I've tried most tactics in the book and both failed with a lot of them, but also su- hopefully succeeded with, a, with, a, with some of them as well. Yeah, great. All right. So you're in good company. Everyone, everyone has their B2B marketing badge of honor. And I think, I think when, when we all look back at our 10, 15, 20 plus years, when you look back and you kind of have a, a big, you know, sigh of like, oh man, I've been doing this for a while. That's your yeah. ticket to the show. That's how you get on the show. You have to, <laughs> you have to have that looking back sigh. All right, great. So like we always do, we're going to jump right into case studies. The first one that you're going to share focuses on the power of, I guess, two, two parts. One is developing a persona or, you know, an ideal customer profile. And along with that comes the power of saying no, right? It's, it's so hard for B2B businesses out there to embrace that. I have always loved that. I think when I started my business, I didn't want to go there because it was like, I can't say no to anyone, but I, I quickly learned that the more carved out my positioning was, the better I could convert people who didn't know me. So anyway, I'm, I'm really Curious about the case study, and I'll have you take it away. Thank you, Steve. And uh, I think you already uh, st- briefly touched upon some of the the things that are important to to mention here. So, my present company, we've a year or well, two years back now, we we finally got ourselves together to try to do this kind of ideal customer profile exercise, where we were to define kind of okay, who are we actually really, really trying to sell to? Up until that point, the the few years before that, we were kind of selling to anyone and everyone we could find in the market that would be willing to, to buy our product. So we ended up having a very diversified pool of, uh, of customers, which, you know, it's nice that you can say that you can sell to a lot of different companies. But in reality, what you end up with is that kind of the use cases that you produce only attracts one or two of parts of uh, of those the product you build you end up spreading your development the engineering team too thin because this type of customer over here wants this feature and that type of customer over there wants this other feature and you know at the end of the day there's n- practically not at any company that has unlimited resources mm-hmm. and in order for us to kind of you know to really pick up traction we we really did, had to go through this ideal customer profile definition project we kept postponing it because it was <laughs> showed up at our doorstep and they wanted yeah. to buy I'm like why don't we just sell to them and then <laughs> postpone it another 6 months and i think what what got us started and i think it can be quite hard to say okay who is it exactly we're trying to to go for i think my advice uh, to this was because um, like the business i'm in now is a subscription business so you really have to hardcore think about will they actually renew their contracts once yep. they're up so we fought uh, long and hard about who is the most likely people to be happy customers of our product i would say that was what we fought Fought, fought mostly about above the, anything else. Yep. Then once we kind of had that figured out, then you can move on to kind of how do we attract them. It's a hard process to get there. And what we actually succeeded with, well, what we basically did was to start with an antithesis of who is our ideal customer profiles, because it can be hard to say exactly who is it, but it's sometimes easy, it's very easy. It's easier to express, okay, it's not those guys over there, for example, with a, this CRM system we don't integrate with. So they're at least not 
our yep. ideal customer profile. Or now we are focused on B two B, so it's not the B two C companies that show up at, at our doorstep. And little by little, I think if you go ask every team in your company, sales team, marketing, the product team, you can start sketching out. Okay, who are we not trying to sell to? And then yep. after that exercise, you can move into, okay, who would be the perfect customers that would be willing to pay a good amount of money for our product, but also be very likely to successfully onboard and also become happy yep. customers that will renew afterwards. And what we really saw after doing this exercise was really that momentum started to pick up across the company because in marketing where I work, we were only trying to attract specifically this kind of people. The sales team would only be assigned accounts that fitted that ideal customer profile. So we run an inbound-based model, but we would only assign the salespeople to accounts that actually looked like our ideal customer profile. So we actually left the demand alone that, that came in yep. that didn't fit. And then the product team, again, also... They only focused on making the our product great for this type of, of company. And that just, like, if you think about it, like a company can only spend its money once. So you need to make sure that it's all the money you spend is moving in, in the same direction. And at least for our company, doing this ideal customer profile definition was was really something that you can say, what do you say, like that was an infliction point for a lot of momentum that everybody started pulling in, in the same direction. Yeah. No, it's really interesting. So... What I like about this story is that most marketers just are using this to define how to, to better speak to people. And what I like what you just said is this wasn't just the, the front end of the messaging. This was the, the business model behind it. You know, like you, you could prioritize development activities based upon if this was a feature that fit into your persona. So I love that, that, that there was business metrics behind understanding. And so as you, how long did it take you to shift that mindset internally from when like the dev team had a better filter to say yes or no to certain pieces of functionality. I think it's kind of, it's not something you just do overnight. I think for us, maybe it took even six months from when we like actually starting dealing with it until it's kind of, okay, we hang this people piece of paper up on, on the wall and it says X, Y, C, this is how we do it. So I think it, and we were just a small company. So I, I could imagine being in a larger company and this process being harder. <laughs> yeah. And smaller companies, you can kind of just say, okay, this is the line. We all are, we're all in the same office here. This is how we're going to do it. Yeah. But you're actually right, Steve. You actually touched upon something super important as well. Like when it comes to communication, it really matters how specific you can communicate. Like, are we talking to all marketers in the world or are we talking to B2B marketers in software companies with 500 to 1,000 employees, then you could be like the message you're trying to get across will travel so much further and faster if it can be super specifically tailored to, to yep. those you're trying to attract. Yep. I want to know more about the sales force. How did they react to this? I mean, my instinct is like most salespeople, like if you're, if you're taking away the target audience and the, and the size goes down, they're, they're inherently fearful of that. So what what was their reaction to refining who you guys sold to? I think initially they struggled a little bit with like spotting the differences in who we should pay attention to or not. But I think over time they they you know we also spent time explaining them why renewals are important and why certain customers are a better fit than others to our product. This kind of this motion came at the same time where we entered into kind of a product led or like a freemium model as well. So. In order for the salespeople to be successful with the set of uh, integrations that our technology offered, you also want to pick those out that you know can plug in and where it works right away. So, so their commission would all uh, it was also easily achievable if they stuck to uh, a certain definition of who they should uh, should try to sell to. But like really in the beginning, it was a bit all over the place because if somebody's booking a demo and they say they are they're interested in buying it, it's it's very hard for a salesperson to. <laughs> to not pick up, pick up the phone. Yep. Um, so I think this there there comes a uh, I don't know if it's an old school world word to use or term, but like it's a, it's also like a little bit of a change management process. You need to kind of yep. week on week you need to enforce it, explain it. Why is this important? Why are we trying to go into this direction? Why shouldn't you spend your time on these? Just take some massage to to make yep. sure that it works out. Interesting. I wonder if anyone's ever gone as far as to change incentives for a sales team to say you know that we know that this profile type is not 
a great fit for our business. So we're not going to pay you as much. I, you know, I would be yeah, interesting yeah. to see if anyone's gone that far in the, you know, like, cause what you said is it's so accurate. It's all about change management and culture change. That's my request. Maybe to our listeners, send us examples of, of businesses that have actually changed the incentive plan to get people aligned. Yeah. I guess you could probably, uh, you can connect some of it to whether the customer renew or not. So yeah. if you've oversold, overpromised in the in the sales process, it will be caught by that component. Do they actually uh, renew the contracts yeah. or not? Yeah, that's I've I've heard of sales teams doing that where, you know, it's not just the front end commission after, you know, 60, 90 days, but there are renewal commissions so that the salesperson knows, oh, I'm going to invest more time in people who are more likely to renew because in theory, I'm getting paid more over time. I thought yeah. that that's always been a smart approach to make sure that the salespeople aren't just gaming the system and they're hitting <laughs> their they're hitting their sixty or ninety day retention threshold, and then they, the customer cancels. Um, yeah, and I think this is also like a it's a cultural thing that management needs to enforce. So if you keep seeing actions that are outside of the strategy. You also need to help align this. And, you know, if examples come up, you have to like talk with the sales team about why is this not the right thing to do? And, you know, if ultimately if they refuse to like align to what is the strategy, then maybe yeah. there's a place they fit better into. Yeah. This is all of a sudden turning into a sales performance podcast. <laughs> and I, mean, I really think this intersection between marketing and sales is is super crucial in, in B2B because yeah. like we can produce the best demand in the world, but if the salespeople look the other way or don't follow up on the leads, like our scorecard is sales in marketing. Yeah. <laughs> That's just so crucial that you make friends with those guys. I agree. I've kind of, in the past, I've even said, I don't like this whole idea of marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads, because to me, it's the same thing. Like the ability for the marketers, you know, and I get people are, you know, they're at different stages in the funnel and maybe the marketers are driving more top of funnel demand. But ultimately you have to have an understanding of if is the person a qualified lead, regardless of where they are in the funnel. And I think that's my hope is one day to stop talking about MQLs and SQLs. It's just QL. That should be the new, <laughs> yeah. that should be yeah, the yeah, new yeah. metric, you know? I, uh, we have actually, we have developed a metric we call sales acceptable leads. So, and so we count the leads that come in that looks like our ideal customers. So th that is the number that we are to deliver on in, in, uh, in marketing. And I kind of like it because here we can be proactive about generating it and not being dependent on whether the, the salesperson is hungover the day that they have the demo calls <laughs> or like just perform poorly in the sales meetings. Yeah. That's an, you know, another thing I've heard companies do is like they plot out their sales forces retention rates over time for these, for these, you know, member customer retention models. And, you know, after a year or two, you have that conversation with your salesperson and say, you're retaining customers at this rate compared to others. And yes, like some of that might be out of their control because of the customer success person on. But if you can clearly plot out, you know, trying to model good behavior of the salespeople who can get people in for longer retention rates. Yeah. It's just an interesting way to look at it. All right. So I, I like this case study. I want to Thanks for sharing the first one. Now we're going to jump into case study number two, which I love. It's, it's about social selling, right? Like, you know, I'll just use LinkedIn as an example. It started out as just a, well, I have a resume or a CV. I'm going to put it online and that's it. And, hey. you know, over the last 10 years, it has evolved into so much more. It's so dynamic and it's from a marketing and sales perspective. It's just, it's a channel that you can't ignore. So um, walk us through case study number two. Yeah, I'm really happy to. So I think m most companies can figure out the buyers in their market that are super active or in market, as you say, right now, where are they present? Typically, you talk about that one or 2% of the market that you could address is actively in market right now. We kind of exhausted those channels in my present company where kind of once you've covered the most obvious search terms in Google with paid ads, organic search ads, you've covered the review platform. So people reading reviews about products in your market, once that's done, which I would always would advise people to start with, then we were facing this challenge that we're one of these like venture funded companies and to kind of unlock the door to the next investment round, we need to be growing extraordinarily fast. We did four and a half X or something like that last year, but to get there, it really need we really really needed to find a resource where we could get in front of the the right people. So if you can say 
in market is the right people at the right time. We needed to find somewhere where we, we could just get in front of the right people so that when it was budget time, they would think of us because in B2B, you know, they don't always have budget or they don't, don't always have time for the project. So we just needed to raise the awareness about our solution significantly amongst our ideal customers. And we tested out different things. YouTube ads, Facebook ads, LinkedIn ads, etc. But podcasts like this as well. What we what we found was the most scalable, most impactful thing that we could do was really what today is probably termed as social selling on LinkedIn. For us, it was something we uh, we kind of stumbled upon it in the beginning. My uh, my colleague Laura, she posted some kind of customer journey photo on LinkedIn and said, "This is one of our clients. We just want or we just want a client." To here's the journey, how's it looking? And then Chris Walker, a really big B2B marketing influencer, he uh, he went and commented on uh, her post. And that one single post got like, I think, 50,000 views or something wow. like that. And that one single day was the peak traffic on our website and the most demo calls booked that we had had uh, historically, even though there was kind of no link in what she posted. And that kind of, you know... As you get some experience, you know how to spot these moments of, okay, there's something here that works. There's, there's some blood in the water here that we need to <laughs> to take a closer look at. So we actually set out to do a, uh, you know, it sounds logical afterwards, but uh, we set out to just do, okay, let's try a quarter where we as a team, all of us try to contribute to this effort. So we set a target of, can we get 300,000 views of our posts during this quarter? Then we'll go for a team night, have a dinner, get some beers, cocktails, yeah. etc. And I think we ended that quarter above 500,000 views because we made it into kind of a, a team effort where we like most people would post every day or every second day on LinkedIn little by little then you organically start to spot what do people react to which of the posts generates leads which of the posts generates reach how do we scale our efforts how do we make sure that we get enough reach so we've set up now a slack channel so when once you've posted you'd share it in there so everybody can go and like and comment and Little by little now, I think I've, I have about 14,000 followers there now. Now on LinkedIn, some of my colleagues are closer to 20,000. And it's, it's incredible to think about. So our target group is B2B marketers. So, and that's probably why it's such an effective tactic. If you're more into those yep. bricks and mortar tactics or like where you need to go golfing or eat steaks, <laughs> then it's probably not the uh, I, I like thing. that. That's in the uh, secret recipe for B two B marketers. There's there's steaks, golf, and then a well, third box. You've uncovered <laughs> the third box. <laughs> probably. So, so I, I think this goes for any tactics you think you need to think about. Who is the person you're trying to get in front of, and where they're present? And I think most B two B marketers they they spend at I at least spend half my day on LinkedIn or something like that. So. We found a very attractive way, a very scalable way to, to get to these people. The underlying then engine of, of this project was also that we, we knew who is our ideal customer profile. You have a hundred connects you can uh, exhaust per week on LinkedIn. So if you every week show up and connect with a hundred people that looks exactly yep. like the ones you, you want to get in front of, then it's kind of, it's not rocket science, but it's just a hard work showing up every week posting quality stuff in front of these people. So little by little, your awareness and what you do become, like starts reaching the right people and suddenly they start engaging with you and they mention you when other people post, etc. And I don't know how many marketers <laughs> there is on LinkedIn and B2B marketers, but there's probably millions, if, if not tens of millions. So if we've really found a channel there, kind of it feels like it's almost inexhaustible because it's so large. What we just need to constantly help each other with is to stay inspired about what are the pieces of content that we can continue to, to put in front of these people. Mm -hmm. And then always remember that it's a team exercise so if one is good at making the the popular posts like memes or funny stuff that just have a wide reach then others might be really good at explaining something super technical but then if the person that has all the reach then goes in and comment on the yep. very technical stuff then that still gets placed in the feet of those that have the the, the far reach as well yeah now that makes sense i think you know my own theory on social selling why it works a lot in the B2B space is it's just about trust. That's the whole process, right? We are here to create something that people can trust and 
and yeah. then buy it. And I think traditionally when the messaging has come from the brand, there is no face to the brand. It's third person. Uh -huh. But when you see online individuals who represent companies, you just, you can trust them faster. And I think that's simple. And when I've looked at the engagement data on that, individual engagements, two, three X usually to what a brand will do. Now, the brand does have the scale, right? So it's not uncommon for a brand to say, well, we have 100,000, a million followers. So I don't advocate going all in on one of those approaches, but the ability for individuals to convert more efficiently, just so much better when you, when you do social selling. I think it's all about this kind of, I think it's called mirror exposure effect. So <laughs> the more you see something, the more you trust it. And you need to think about to make B2B buying decisions you're looking at journeys that are six or 12 months. And like we put out some benchmarks last year that like we had the average journey would be like from our, from our customers from first touch until you win a deal, it would be 192 days. And there would be 31 tracked digital sessions. And I think yes. you could easily time that number by two or three of how many exposures you actually need to a brand before you trust it. Yeah. So like one thing is this kind of social selling tactic, but another touch could be the sales rep that calls them up, builds trust. It can be case studies, retargeting ads. You know, you can even send physical letters to get another uh, brand touch point in, uh, in front of them. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I love the case study. We're going to jump into Q&A and tell us about your first marketing job. Yeah. I would start with my first full-time job. I've probably done marketing before that as well, but now I started out, you can say in a two-man band where we, uh, this guy I worked together with had invented this online marketplace for vintage music instruments. Huh. And uh, what we kind of had there suddenly was we had 10,000 vintage music instruments so it was, would be like a gibson les paul <laughs> 1970 blue or uh, stuff like that and the model was kind of to get the physical shop to upload their their products to the website okay but what i like my like first entry into marketing was the like i don't know if it's a niche tactic but search engine optimization so like all these guitars when people search for that on google we really really needed to to get them on top of the search so that the demand would come into our website and then funnel through to the uh, the physical uh, shops that were selling these guitars. Now, I think if we had done as well as we did uh, today that we, but this, the company basically failed and we went bankrupt, but we managed to like, I think we managed to get to like a six figure organic traffic every month, but yeah. this is back in 2010 or something like that. So yeah. People, we had to struggle to get like $40 for a subscription where we would be sending them a thousand, two thousand clicks every month to the website, which I think today people would get it. There's affiliate tracking, you know, yep. they're custom to stuff. But we, so kind of, and that was kind of also my, one of my like pillars of learning why it's so important to impact revenue with your marketing, because you could say we grew the organic traffic extremely large, but we didn't manage to monetize it. And then, you know, businesses fail. <laughs> so yep. kind of, it's good that you have traction in a certain thing you do, but it also needs to co connect to revenue in some way. Otherwise, <laughs> you need a big bank account to, to keep, uh, keep on yep. uh, that one tactic. I remember, you know, as you mentioned, like this is the earlier days of SEO. I remember I bought a piece of furniture for a home and we had someone help us select a bunch of furniture and they were like, oh, the good thing is, bring it into your home. If it doesn't work out, we'll take care of it. Right. And the yes. designer who, the designer who selected this piece of furniture, the, the scale was just completely off. It looked so <laughs> awkward. We called her up and she's like, we're not going to take it back. I just was like, this is ridiculous. This is your policy. I couldn't get any traction. I had a blogger account at the time. I, you know, like just personal blog. So I go, I'm going to go write an article about this, this experience. I think within the two or three days, the search engine ranked it pretty high using yeah. their brand's keywords. <laughs> I got a call from the corporate office apologizing and like they were the friendliest I had ever experienced <laughs> with this company. And I was like, I don't think you could do that today. Like, you know, there is so much demand for things like that. But yeah, once I won't name their name, keeping it anonymous, but yeah. <laughs> big brand name. And man, they were so good about following up and making sure that I was happy. Yeah, I think this is the the painful and interesting part of, of marketing is that like tactics, they, they each have their time and then all of us gets on podcast conferences yep. etc and we tell each other about how well it works and then 
we exhaust yeah. this and, and now it's, it's done. Remote, yeah. And then we need to move on <laughs> to another tactic. <laughs> so it just continues. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm always interested in what's not being talked about out loud in conferences yeah. because there's always people who are like, I'm not sharing this. This is too yeah. good. Why would I why, why would I share this? <laughs> yeah, awesome. All right. So what what about your next job? I liked how you you started and failed. I say that in a in a good way, right? Because you you learn more. You don't want to be failing at the end of your career. You want to be failing at the beginning of your career, right? But what did you do after the uh, the online marketplace? The story can it, it's like kind of when you look back at it, it's it's funny how things turn out. But uh, at my last that first company, I was uh, I read the Four Hour Work Week uh, by Tim Ferriss, a really interesting book. And in that book, that he mentioned that uh, hey, you can use this platform called Elance, and then you can just outsource all the work you don't want to do. <laughs> so uh, I during my tenure there at that uh, vintage music instrument platform where we started posting jobs there, and I think I wrote a blog post about how we did it and like we had a little organization of 10 people with some in india some in europe and then some in in the u.s and uh, like once when then elans were opening the first office in uh, europe which is now upwork this freelance platform they just basically asked me whether i wanted to come join that european office and uh, you know like spread elans in in europe and since I was kind of a, and I was already an ambassador and I, I knew the type of people that, that would be good fits here. I uh, hadn't been making any money for a couple of years then. I joined that Elance office that then became Elance Odesk and then Upwork at the end of the tenure. And I was the country manager for the Nordic countries, which is like Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Finland. Yeah. Now, I, Upwork's a really interesting model. It's amazing. You're kind of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a direct to employee model or a direct to freelance model. Yeah. And it's also, it's a very hard model to execute as well, because it's like one thing is that uh, an Uber ride, that's everybody wants the same. They want a car that takes me from A to B, but with work, it's more like I need a graphic designer or I need a PHP developer or somebody who can write SQL or I need a translator. So this, uh, there's constantly chicken and eggs problems between mm -hmm. what is the demand we're generating in terms of work task? Do we have people that performs it? And can we match those two together? Which yeah. then kind of when I was done there, I was happy to have a more uh, specific task uh, at hand kind of, okay, you have this thing you need to sell and it's this people who, who's going to take it. Whereas at Upwork, it was more, a much more broad scope of, uh, of, of go to market, you can say, because the product was relevant for everybody in the world. Yep. You didn't know it, but you were working, you were essentially working at an online dating site. It just wasn't, <laughs> people weren't looking for partners. They were looking for, for people yeah. to do their job. But no, yeah, I, to me, I still absolutely love the concept because, you no, know, I think you say that like uh, talent is equally distributed around the world, but opportunity is not. So you can, you can really like, just because you have a task in the city you live in, there's other people who are incredibly talented, who's living in a country that is not as expensive as the country you're living in, and they would happily take up your task. Yep. You get a more effective payment structure for getting work done, and they oftentimes they make more than the local rate of yep. what they, they could have done. Yeah. Tell me about out of focus. We've talked about some recent jobs. I want to talk about where do you see everything going? Like, you know, there's obviously technology is the biggest thing that just constantly moves and it's the catalyst for a lot of what we do. What are, what are some movements that you see happening in the B2B marketing space? I think one thing is, as you touched, we touched upon earlier, is that the need for like crisp brands and communication is going to only grow because the competition is just heating up because the world just becomes more and more transparent through the internet. So Everybody has a website now. So like for many product, product products, you're competing against hundreds of companies who could do something similar. So like you really need to stand out with your brand and your communication. Otherwise, there's no chance that you can break through the noise with paid marketing or yep. trade shows or stuff like that. So it's kind of, and then on that, that's kind of one component. And the other component is then you also need to heavily utilize all the latest technology that makes you more effective than, than your competition. And, you know, but for me, that just exemplifies why marketing is such a tough, diverse job because it's this constant left and right brain. You need to be super creative, great at commun yep. communicating, etc. But you also need to be hyper effective with your resources and how you utilize technology <laughs> and so forth. The good thing, though, is that you can have a team and you don't have to have everything in, in one yep. person. But <laughs> as a leader, you can get a little bit dizzy having to to kind of manage all of that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, that I agree with that. It is, it is crazy how 
harder it is to keep up in today's you know marketing stack i enjoy it like that's what that's what gets me going because i'm such a technology person as an enabler of sales and marketing yeah, that i right. just i constantly i'm like oh my god this is exciting. How how can I use this to get better? Yeah. But in the beginning of my career, there was nothing like that. It was like, this is how all the equipment works. You're going to print this. You're going to buy media here. And that's about it. You know? <laughs> and that was like, okay, we missed the deadline for the, you know, the July edition of whatever trade magazine. So we're going to yeah, wait yeah. For, for August. Wow, that yeah. was, you know, so it, it is, it's funny how um, you need to stay on top of it. Otherwise a competitor will just blow you away. Like it's not something I master, but this chat GPT is also like I can almost not have it in my brain how yeah. much gonna it's gonna impact everything. Like I will tell you two things I've I've done uh, the last week. I I took we have a hundred and eleven reviews on a platform called G two, so kind of people yep. saying something about our product, and I put it into chat GPT and asked them to, to can you please just summarize the five things people mentioned the most in these reviews, and then like. Five minutes later, like two minutes later, a half, I know what our customers are saying when they write reviews, yep. which is like an analysis that would probably take a day or two days, three days uh, in the past. And it's I, it's so massive what it's going to change once it's going to be ingrained in how people work. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I think the last couple of months, people have incorrectly gone to content creation. Oh, AI, this will write this for me. Blog posts, social posts. I, I think that may work. I think that it's not as easy as that, but I, I think there's still a role for that. But to me, it's the insight development. It's the feeding a bunch of data into OpenAI's platform and have it do the thinking. And then you validate, oh, I, that actually sounds right. Let me, you know, I kind of, I described it to someone recently as it's like an algebra equation. And once you solve for it, then you can take that answer and and plug it back into the formula and be like, well, is this really, is this working? I do. I think the insights that that platform, I, I was there, um, they rolled out GPT-4 recently. I watched the online demo. Oh, I started okay, yeah. playing around with it. Yeah. <laughs> and even now it's like, I was asking it to do things where I put a bunch of data in there and then I said, once you output the data, I want you to output it in this way. I want you to create a table and column A is this, column B <laughs> is that. So it's, it structured that data for me. And I was like, man, it, it would take me 10 minutes just to structure the data that it gave me. And now it's doing it for me. I just, I don't know. I like, you want to like walk away from your computer and be like, I can't handle this. Like this is this is too powerful. No, I'm not much for for hype cycles, and I hate buzzwords. But but this it really feels like an infliction point right now. That if you really get to master that muscle yep. that you have there, there's really an in, insane potential. But I'm not even close to knowing enough about it to to. Re I can just see with my own eyes what it answers when when I put yeah. in stuff. It's it's crazy. Here's my here's my own. This is a sneak peek at my learning model as it relates to this specifically. So. Yeah. I was on TikTok for a while. I spent way too much time on it. So I banned myself from it. So I'm in my like month four or five ban of TikTok. But I have a, I have a special pass to go on TikTok that I give myself. And specifically for AI or GPT-3 or 4, I will search it. And I've, I've been able to learn faster using TikTok because it's such a short window of, of a video. So I can spend 10 minutes on TikTok just off of a search query and learn so much like i feel like the content is produced so much faster as opposed to going going to youtube where you're waiting for like viewers to to essentially upvote your your search results that's my fastest way to learn about the new stuff is just search for it on, on tiktok sure and people are yeah. <laughs> no, all right anything else you want to share with with the listeners we've had a really good conversation about just how to sell more effectively where where things are headed anything else island <laughs> i don't know which uh I know so many other topics that we can uh, dwell into, but probably <laughs> probably shouldn't. What's the all right? We'll do one thing. What drives you? What drives you crazy? What's one thing in the in the B two B marketing space that you're like, I can't handle this stuff. If I say it one more time, I'm gonna go nuts. Something that is on my mind, which you probably have even more experience with, Steve, is kind of how competition behaves. Like some of them play nice, some of them completely copies your go-to-market, some of them talk badly about you, some, some of them lie about you in your ads and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm really on to kind of, lately I've been on to kind of getting too upset about these things. And um, maybe you can be my psychologist saying to yeah. kind of just relax, <laughs> focus on your own uh, business. 
but it's it's I think I find it quite interesting that like sometimes you need to pay attention to what is the competition doing, but you don't want to be following them. You want to be going on your own path, having them following you. <laughs> so lately, yeah. I've been detoxing by like disconnecting myself from them from on LinkedIn, not going to look at the web pages, etc. Because what you really need to figure out is kind of what is really the the path. For, for your company, the business that you're in, like what is the like the clear path that you need to take and not be constantly yep. misaligned by what competition and saying and stressing out about a new feature or stuff like that. But I don't know how Steve you you manage to keep cool in in these situations. Well one that you know who 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 are you to say that I keep cool in all situations? But you know <laughs> I try to. I think I someone gave me good advice when it came to this as they said understand what your competition is doing, but don't obsess over it. Because what, you know, what you just said is once you start obsessing, then you're not leading it. You're not leading in the market. You are essentially pivoting left and right and left and right. And it takes away your ability to do any long-term planning because you essentially put yourself in a position where, well, I don't know what they're going to do in six months. So I can't plan that out. And, you know, you want to avoid that. So, you know, yeah, I think be smart about it know what they're doing, but, you know, focus on your business. As soon as they take 10, 20% of your brain where you're not focused on your own core business or your own customer need, yeah, then they've won, you know. It's, uh, I think that's really, really spot on. I was particularly kind of what is the long-term path that you want to go on and then like forget about like if they release a feature or two that it doesn't matter for where you're going. And yeah. like, the only thing you can impact is how well you treat your current customers and like the next marketing activities you go out and do. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just, you know, I'll use an example of that, you know, there's a, there's a CRM solution that I use. It's a medium sized company. And, you know, I do a task where in my prospecting, I will send an attachment to people yeah. um, as like part of a nurture program. So they already know who I am, but I'm just, I'm nurturing them an email. And I used to have to save, get the file from my desktop, upload it. And there was like three or four steps and clicks. Yeah. And, the CRM company like had an enhancement and they said, oh, now you just upload the file into here. And it's literally, you just, you can send an email that has the attachment in it. And that happened. And I'm like, oh my God, like this has saved me so much time. I, I bring this example up is because they didn't copy a competitor. They figured out what the customer's pain was and just focused yeah. on that. So I, I think that's, that's my other advice is you start focusing on your competitors, you need to be spending more time with your, with your clients or customers and seeing what, what they really need. That's, that's how you're ultimately going to grow it. I think that's really good advice, Tish. All right. Well, Thanks awesome, Stefan. My, uh, my pains. Yeah. We'll send, <laughs> we'll send each other the therapy bills afterwards. This is, <laughs> this is maybe, maybe the podcast can be a, a medical write-off. It can be a medical expense. <laughs> we'll consult our respective tax advisors on that one, but Stefan, thank you for joining Interesting B2B Marketers today, and I look forward to everyone tuning in for the next show. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Interesting B2B Marketers podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you heard this podcast so you never miss an episode. If you found value in today's episode, please help grow the podcast by sharing with others and leaving a review. We'll see you next time. 